Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. We are finishing up the book of Job today. Uh, we're not finishing the quarter. We still have uh, some more to go in that, but we are finishing up the book of Job and uh, it's going to be an, an interesting time as we wrap up everything. And so uh, this passage, chapter 42, really does uh, provide a closure for the book. It really demonstrates uh, what what the desired outcome was. And, and it shows where Job realized uh, very clearly uh, what, who God was and, and that he was in control. And so uh, this is a very important passage, but it's a very simple and straightforward passage. And so I'm looking forward to, to diving in together with you uh, to see where, uh, where God is in control, to see where we as, as humans, as his creation, we need to rely on him. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at uh, Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 11. And so go ahead and be turning there. And as you do, I want to ask a question. And uh, it's uh, it's kind of a throwback. I, I've never had to experience this, um, at least this particular thing. But have you ever remembered in, and uh, where in school, uh, someone would have to write a phrase on the on the board over and over and over again, uh, something like, uh, I will not talk in class, I will not talk in class, and they write it over and over again. Uh, there's there's other uh, th uh, images of that you see it in movies and other things like that. And and this this punishment, this uh, repetitive action, um, really drives home a point, right. And so um, I'm not sure how effective it is, I probably would get really Really frustrated uh, having to do it over and over again uh, but that's just my sinful nature uh, because I just I, I would not enjoy it I think that's why they use it as punishment but but really uh, as we think about this as we think about a, a student having to write over and over I will not do this or I will do this in the future uh, over and over again um, it's not an exact analogy it's not a one-to-one -one analogy with Job uh, because Job wasn't being punished for doing something wrong uh, that's the whole emphasis is that um, that we see that there's there is a reality that suffering does happen and we need to trust in God right but the analogy does drive home a point and I think it's very similar in the the situation with Job and the underlying point is that we need to acknowledge or we need to admit uh, whenever we were wrong and, and we're gonna see Job do that we're gonna see Job acknowledge or admit uh, where he was wrong and what he was talking about God and so um, we're gonna look at that we're gonna see uh, the the friends uh, his friends repent as well and and all throughout this we're gonna see God's grace and so that's what we're gonna be looking at today and so if you would go ahead and look at Job chapter 42 starting in verse number one what I'm going to do, um, just to kind of summarize this entire book of the Bible, uh, kind of just to finish it up, uh, I'm going to read the passages, verses 1 through 11 in chapter 42, and we're going to ask a couple questions. The first question we're going to ask and answer is, what do we learn about God? What do we learn about God? So go ahead and turn with me to chapter 42, verse 1 and following. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything. And no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, reject. I reject my words, and I'm sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. Verse 7, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Elipaz the Timonite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Then my servant Job will pray for you. I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Then Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite went and did as the Lord told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. 
After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. All his brothers, sisters, and former acquaintances came to him and dined with him in his house. They sympathized with him and comforted him concerning all the adversary, ad, adversity the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave a piece of silver and gold and a gold earring. And so these 11 verses um, bring us uh, essentially to the conclusion of Job. And so the, the question I wanted to ask is what do we learn about God? Not just in these verses, but really in the whole book of Job. And it's really summarized in these verses here. And so what do we learn? And I think Job does a great job of summarizing this. So first of all, you see here in verse two, Job comes to realize, he comes to recognize that God is capable of anything. He is powerful. He is sovereign. He is, he is in control. He is almighty. He's uh, um, all powerful. God can do anything. And God reveals that to him in the previous uh, two, two to three chapters, 38, 39, 40, and 41. We see this conversation between God and Job, and, and Job <laughs> recognizes I was, uh, I was out of my depths because God is capable. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the one who, uh, his, his power, his, mag, um, um, his, his, um, his power is magnified through creation. And so Job recognizes that God can do anything. And, and that's something that we need to be reminded of. We look at a sunset. We look at creation. We look around us and we see that. We read scripture and we see how God has dealt throughout history. And we're reminded again of that. We learn from this passage that God is all powerful. He's capable to do anything. And so that's the, the first thing I would say that we, we learn from Job is God is all powerful. But he goes on and says this, not only is it all powerful, but that what that means is that any plans of God cannot be thwarted. Or the way it says it here in verse 2, it says, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. Uh, we recognize that God is sovereign and in control over everything. And it's hard to wrap our mind around that and, and to think about it. Uh, but he is. He is in control. What does that mean? Well, in the book of Job, we learn uh, throughout uh, is that there's nothing that surprises him. He is the one who permitted these things to happen to Job. Uh, that doesn't uh, stop us from asking questions. We want to know some information. Job wanted to know some information. He wanted to know why. Um, but here's the deal. What, we, what Job finally recognizes, what he realizes, is that he doesn't have to be concerned. He doesn't have to be afraid because he knows that nothing that God plans can be thwarted. No plan of yours can be thwarted. And so that's a very encouragement to Job because of specifically that reality that, that we can trust in God no matter what happens. Nothing takes, us, takes him by surprise. He permits all things to happen. Uh, verses 3, uh, it goes a little bit more in depth. Job is kind of uh, restating God's question that he asked him earlier. And the question was, Who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. So what do we learn about God in this passage, this verse right here? Uh, very clearly, in the next verse as well, verse 4, um, it, very clearly we learn that God is a God of wisdom. He is a God who has wisdom and counsel, and uh, we need to seek that. We don't need to hide it in our ignorance. Uh, we need to be looking and seeking it out. Uh, the wisdom literature, Job is often viewed as a wisdom literature because it's very poetic, etc. And it talks about the pursuing wisdom. Early on, we see that. And so we learn that God is, uh, the, fear, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And, and we see here, Job recognizes that very clearly, that we need to seek God's wisdom. Seek God's counsel. And the, the danger is, is that we can hide it in our ignorance. And so that's something else we learn, that God is very wise. God, is, God has got wise counsel for us, and we just need to turn and listen to it. Um, so what do we learn about God? That's what we're asking, and that's what we're answering right now. And we're going to skip down a little bit further um, about uh, verses 4, 5, 6. We're going to skip through that. We're going to come back in just a minute. Uh, but here we skip on to verse 7. And so what do we learn about God? After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Timonite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth 
about me as my servant Job has. Well, well, this this whole section here, we see that God comes and he approaches them and says to them, I'm I'm angry with you because you have not spoken truth. He's holding them accountable for their words and for their actions. And he calls them to go and repent, offer sacrifices, and, and seek forgiveness, not only from God, but also from Job. And so what do we learn about God in this? God desires truth. God is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We see that in John 14, 6. We see throughout Scripture that God is truth, and He he desires for us to speak the truth. And He holds people accountable for their actions, for their words, uh, for the things that they say. And so we see in this passage right here, we see uh, that the reality of God's justice, God's truth, uh, and, and we are reminded of that, that, that we need to speak the truth. And we'll get into that a little bit more in just a second. Um, but uh, So we see God, His truth, um, His perfection, His holiness. And we see the sacrificial thing. H- how are they cleansed? How do they make amends, so to speak? V- ch- verse 8 says, Now take seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Then my servant Job will pray for you. I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. And so we see, um, we see not only God's truth and justice, his righteousness, his holiness here uh, through the sacrificial system, we also see his mercy and his grace. Specifically, his mercy. It says, I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. Mercy is not giving what is deserved. Uh, when God shows his mercy, he does not uh, give us the judgment that we rightfully deserve. Uh, we see this with the cross. We see uh, Romans uh, 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? We understand that. We're all sinners. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, the penalty, the payment for sin is death. But it goes on in that verse, Romans 6.23 says, but, or, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And so we see that, that God's mercy is shown here to Job's friends. And we see that God is a God of mercy. And he's a God of love and, and compassion. And he provides an opportunity for people to repent. And uh, we see it at the cross. We see it here as God is talking to them. And so we, we see God's justice, we see God's truth, we see God's holiness, we see God's uh, mercy and His grace here. Well, it ends with the Lord accepted Job's prayer. I think the, the thing we hear, see here through the whole entire book of Job, but also specifically here, is that we, ha- we have a God. We worship a God. Uh, we worship the God, the creator of the universe, who hears us. He, he does not ignore us. Now, uh, we can go through scripture, we can talk about prayer, and we can uh, talk about how we are, need to pray, pray uh, in accordance with God's will and, and other things like that. But the clear thing is this, is that we see in the book of Job that Job cries out to God and God hears him. And, and we as believers are called to cry out to him. We may, not get, um, we may not get an answer specifically. In fact, Job is never told exactly why he suffered. We see a little bit at the beginning of chapter 1, we have some background information, but Job has never revealed that. He just learns to trust in God. And, and I think very helpful for us is that we see here in this passage of God who hears us. <clears throat> and so we see the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Um, And so that's a a very encouraging thing that uh, there is a God who hears us and we need to be praying for him. Uh, We need to be praying to him in his will, uh, praying in the Father's will. And so uh, what else do we learn about God here? Well, verses 10 through 11, we see after this that that God restored uh, Job's fortunes and his friends. Um, So we see that uh, his brothers and his sisters and his family and his friends all came and they sympathized with him. We see uh, a conclusion. And I I think uh, something very important before we go on is to understand that um, Job is here is not, uh, the the book of Job here is not trying to make an argument that that, um, one, when Job repented, he was restored. Uh, that would be the what the friends had specifically said. The friends said that you had some sin in your life, and when you repent, God will restore you. God will heal you. God will uh, show his blessings on you. Um, but that doesn't make any sense in this passage, because look at verse 7 again. I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me, as my servant Job has. We see very clearly that the friends were wrong. So what's going on here? Well, verses 10 and 11 demonstrate that, that God... Um, God can and God will 
and he, but he may not choose to restore people. When people go through suffering um, and, and, and challenges and difficulty, God can and he may restore people. We see here that he does restore Job, and yet this is not something that's guaranteed to all people who go through challenges and difficult times. There are promises for believers. I want to turn to one right now. Um, one is in Romans 8:18. 8, Romans 8:18. 8, it says, "For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing." with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Paul here is saying the sufferings that are going on, and he, he experienced many sufferings, are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to come. He, he In Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 20, 21, 22, actually, sorry, uh, 19, 20, 21, we see that Paul is longing for the time where he will receive a glorified body. And he's looking to the fact that we are citizens of heaven. As believers, we're citizens of heaven, and we're looking forward to that time where God is going to redeem us. And so there is a, there is a promise of restoration, but it's not a promise of restoration here right now on the earth. And so here, I just wanted to touch on that, is that Job is restored. And God chose to do that. But that is not trying to pr uh, provide a, a, a theological uh, uh, ex ex explanation about what's going on in this situation. It's just demonstrating what God did for Job and what God may do for us and others. Uh, the main thing is to understand is that God receives the glory. God is the one who did it. God is the one who is victorious. God is the one who is powerful. He's the one who has the plan. So, but, but what do we learn about God in verses 10 through 11? Well, Primarily that God is loving. God is gracious. God understands um, that that he um, that we need his his blessing and his his will in our life. And so we see uh, this restoration, and we long maybe not for a restoration here on earth for us and for our friends and our family who are suffering, but we definitely are holding on, grasping to the hope that Jesus said that as he is raised, we will also be raised. As we are longing for that glorified body like Paul talked about in, in Philippians chapter 3. So those verses, we've been uh, studying and, and asking the question, what do we learn about God? Now we're going we're gonna to change the, the question a little bit and ask, what do we learn about man? throughout the whole book of Job, specifically being summarized here in chapter 42. I'm not going to read the whole passage again. Feel free to pause the video and, and read the whole passage and, and write down your own question, your own uh, comments and thoughts on it. But what do we learn about man in this passage? First of all, we learn that uh, Job, uh, Job had to get the message through his, his thick skull. I'm not saying he was stubborn. I'm just saying that I know myself and I see this this image of, of someone who he really had to learn uh, from God directly. That God really had to hammer it home for him. Um, <clears throat> he was getting a little bitter and, and yet now we see here in verse 2 we see that he understands who God is. And so we, we've already talked about that but he says, I know that you can do anything. Verse 3, surely uh, he, he talks about this. He says, Job saying, surely I spoke about things I did not understand. Things too wondrous for me to know. We see the word there, uh, know or knowledge. We see this idea is that Job, he really had to learn and, and we need to come to God to learn. Uh, it goes on and talks about God's counsel, uh, his counsel. Uh, we are ignorant of, of the things of the world. And yet when we read scripture, as we dive into God's word, as we pour into it and we desire to get closer to God, uh, we can see God's wisdom and we can learn from it. And so we can know. So uh, I guess the thing that to summarize this whole, whole little point I'm trying to make is this, is that we need God's wisdom. Uh, there are things that happen in the world that we just don't know. And we have to trust in God. We have to turn to him and rely on him. Um, I guess another thing would would say is that we, another thing we learn about Job, uh, excuse me, about humanity in the book of Job is we specifically learn uh, that we want to be in control. Uh, it's just the the default nature is we don't like being out of control, but we want to be in control. Yet what God calls us to do is trust in Him. We can't replace God. We can't step into the, the place of God. And that's essentially what Job was doing. I believe it was last week we talked about verse chapter 40 where uh, Job basically said, I'm significant. How can I answer you? I have spoken once. I will not reply twice, but now I can add nothing. Job in chapter 40 was like, 
oh, I tried to take your place. I didn't know what I was talking about. And, um, and, and yet that's what it seemed like is Job wanted to uh, talk about what is righteous and what it, the righteous judgment that needed to happen in the world and that God was failing and things like that. And so um, we learn that, that we like to be in control um, and we speak about things we don't always understand, but we need to trust in God. Um, something that I think uh, is important and kind of why I started with the, the little analogy about writing a phrase, I will not talk in class, I will not talk in class on, on the chalkboard, is uh, verse 6. Um, uh, verse 6 says, Therefore I reject my words and I am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. Here we see repentance. And I think that's the very key of this, this final thing is we see uh, the importance of repenting. What happened for Job to repent. Well, first of all, uh, what it says here in verse 7, it says, the friends did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job has. What Job had said wasn't necessarily wrong, but it was more so his attitude. <coughs> Excuse me. He was beginning to become uh, bitter and, 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 and really call God out, and he was accusing God of being unjust. And so Job repented of his, his attitude toward God. Um, not that he had questioned God or, or called out to God, but that because of, uh, of his bitterness, he, he allowed it to um, cause, become sin in his, his, himself, in his mind. And so, um, but I, I want to point out verse 5. Verse 5 says, I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. What do we learn about man? First of all, we need to repent, but two, repentance comes through a, a personal relationship with God, coming face to face with our Creator. Um, the, the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, it begins all the way back in Genesis, creation. God created the heavens and the earth. He is the creator. He knows us. He, he desires to be in a relationship with us. But sin, the bad news is, is that sin separated us from him. So we look at the good news is that when we are presented with Christ, we see God's love and we see the ability to repent and turn to him. And so here we see this idea, but now my eyes have seen you. Uh, Job um, came face to face with God. He, he recognized who God was, and that caused him to repent. We see it in uh, the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 6, he says, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. All throughout Scripture we see as people come closer to God, they see their sin and they repent. They, they confess it and repent. And, and I think that's so important for us is that we need to come to God, not just for wisdom. We come, need to come for God, to God, not just for mercy and grace. We need to come for God, to God and recognize who He is so that we can see our sinfulness and repent and turn from Him. <coughs> Excuse me. So verse 7 uh, through, through, verse seven through 9, uh, what do we learn about man here? Well, we learn that uh, we, we can sometimes stick our foot in our mouth um, we see here that the friends, they spoke that what was not true. They spoke what was not true. And uh, we've already talked about repentance and how God called them to, to offer sacrifices and seek forgiveness. But I want to say this, is that we see here <clears throat> that we can stick our foot in our mouths. And I, one of the things that I, I very much try to do is to support everything I'm saying with Scripture. I'm not trying to tweak Scripture to support what I believe. I'm trying to look to Scripture to find out what is true. And so I use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And so I want to encourage you to do the same thing, is to, to make sure that we are speaking what is true about God. And the only way we can do that is by studying Scripture, by, a, by understanding it, uh, looking at it, um, uh, rightfully dividing the word of truth, as Timothy says, or as, as it says in Timothy. And so um, we need to be careful about speaking for God and, and, and doing it incorrectly. In and so we need to very much look to God's word. But that brings us to the final question. We've asked what does this tell us about God and then what does this tell us about man? Uh, but what it, bottom line is, as, uh, as we read the scripture, it needs to change us. We, we, we need to apply it in our life. And so what does this mean for my life? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for you? There's a lot of application a lot of application in the passage. And you can go back and uh, list out things that you learn about God, list out things that you learn about man, and really just decide on this is what God is convicting me of right now. And so that's something you need to do. Uh, but just a couple of quick things. Um, what does this mean? Well, it means that we might have to let go of being in control because we're certainly not. God is in control. God is sovereign. None of his plans can be distorted. 
uh, but we needed to trust in him. And so the more we try to hold on and be in control, unfortunately, is the opportunity for us to make a ton of mistakes, uh, like Job's friends. And so I, I would say the first thing is to surrender control and trust in God. Just surrender control, trust in God. Um, we, we seek His wisdom. We seek His counsel. We desire to live for Him. And, and what that means is we're not always going to know what's going on. Job never got a response as to why he was suffering. Yet, we see that his relationship with God grew in strength, and he trusted God ever, ever more, um, not because he got the answer, but because he realized who God was. And so I want to encourage us to do the same, is to, to surrender control to God. He is in control. He is sovereign. And so seeking his face, seeking his word, and desiring to learn from him and trust him and listen to what he calls us to do as believers. And so that's the first thing. <clears throat> uh, this, I guess the second thing is um, repent repentance whether you're you're like job's friends and you've you've been speaking on behalf of god but you've been wrong you've been incorrect perhaps you need to repent um you've been giving poor advice you've been sp speaking uh, against scripture well, that's something that we need to repent of maybe it's like job and and you thought you were in the right and you kind of were saying the right things but your attitude was wrong uh, there are so many things that we need to repent of, and, and we can look at this passage, we can look throughout Scripture. main thing is to, to seek God's face. Um, there's a verse that says, um, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Uh, there's a passage that where there's a prayer where uh, we ask God to, to search our hearts, search my heart, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Uh, we need to individually repent for our sins, and, and we have to ask God to reveal that to us. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy for us to admit uh, our failures and our, our shortcomings, uh, but it's so important for us as we, uh, uh, as James says, God's word is like a mirror, and as you look in the mirror, you're gonna see uh, what is good and what is right. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a paraphrase. I would encourage you to read James chapter 1, 22 through 25, but it talks about how God's Word is a mirror and it shows us uh, where, where we need to confess our sins. It shows us our, f our flaws in our life. And so we study God's Word in order to draw closer to God, be more, become more like God, repenting and confessing our sins. Uh, what that might deal with, what that might begin with is confessing that, that God, I, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And if you've never done that, I would encourage you to do that. I want to hear if you've done that. So you can go to our website and say yes to Jesus. Click on there. We would love to hear that. We'd love to get in touch with you. Or you can, uh, on Facebook here or whatnot, you can send us a message. But what does this mean for my life? What does this mean for my life? Well, basically, we can't, uh, excuse me, what does this mean for my life? We need to trust God, surrender, our control, and, and, and completely trust in Him. We need to repent. And also, we can hold on to the promises of God. What are the promises? I read Romans 8, verse 18 earlier. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Um, there's that uh, the promise of what he, he is looking forward to, and he's holding on to that. There's another passage I want to look at, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolute, incomparable, eternal weight of glory. So, we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and, 19, uh, 17 and 18. But Paul is, is conveying something. And that's that we need to um, we need to understand that God is in control and that He has a plan. And the plan revealed throughout Scripture is that uh, that believers who hold fast and trust in Him, they are promised restoration. They're promised uh, a redemption. We are redeemed of our sins, but we will be restored um, in, in that moment, in that final moment, and when we are in His presence. And so we can trust in that. Uh, we don't know what's going on all the time. We don't know why things are going on. 
but we do know that God is in control and we can trust him in that. And so thank you for, for tuning in. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other applications you can pull from this. I'm going to close this in prayer and then we'll be dismissed and, and we'll meet again next week. Um, and it's going to be a good time. So dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this passage as we can study it and learn more about you. See um, the, the, the error in our ways and, and learn from it. And, and I pray confess and repent from it. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy that was shown to the friends. Uh, the fact that um, when, we, when we're wrong, uh, you, you still show us mercy. There are ac there's accountability for our actions, but there is mercy uh, for our sin, and you, you forgive those who confess it. So God, I pray that you will reveal the sin in my heart. You will reveal the sin in our hearts so that we can confess it before you, turn from it, and follow after you. So God, thank you for this opportunity to study God's word, your word. Thank you for this opportunity to dive in together. And so we want to glorify you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for tuning in, and we'll meet again next week.